Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, it's February 22nd, 2017. The sun's out, kind of a rare thing. And it actually is gonna get up into the 50s today here on, on the uh, demonstration site. And behind me here is a row of peaches, uh, various different cultivars of peaches. And, uh, and I'm gonna go over uh, a couple of issues that I've had and 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 I'll probably may discuss some of the possible solutions but I wanted to share at least some of my failures with you uh, on site now this is back in an area back on the property let's see if I can turn this you can see the solar panels out here on the other side of the solar panels is the first food forest and then way up front is the second food forest and back here is a, is a spot that I started planting uh, hugel culture beds or uh, woody beds and in fact this row of peaches here are all uh, planted on top of a uh, woody bed where it's about three foot wide two to three feet deep I can't remember the exact but it was really mounted up high and I planted a whole variety of different species here and I've had a problem uh, the problem that I've had is the, the, the white-tailed deer coming in and uh, doing antler rubs on it. Uh, and it's really torn off the bark on the trees. And I'm gonna try and get some photos and show those to you. Uh, I know that holding this little camera isn't gonna work out that well. But uh, two things I'll say is peaches and nectarines are the sa same species. There's a variety of different cultivars. So all, all different uh, flavor and timing of the fruit being produced and all. But I'll go over some of the, the uh, things I would do differently in the future. Okay, here we go. So these are some photographs that I've taken um, of the peach trees that we discussed earlier. So in this image, we can see some of the bark. There's some bark that's actually somewhat still intact. So we can look at this part here, but some of it's been torn away here. You can see some of it rolling back. You can see some of the fibrous connective tissue of the inner tree surface, the, the, uh, the sap wood here, the hardwood, uh, the heartwood inside, a large split in the tree. So severely damaged. Here we can see on the outer layer just a hint of some of the bark that's still intact and over here as well and a little bit up here but a large area of the tree, uh, all of the bark has been torn right off. The cambium layer is missing and it's starting to get some mold growth on the uh, surface of the uh, sapwood and, and hardwood surfaces that are there. Here's an area that hasn't been torn away quite as much but still severely damaged. We can see some of the intact bark here, the outer bark layer peeling back, outer bark layer peeling back here, inner bark layer here, which is part of the cambium. So here's part of the uh, xylem here, and we're getting down into the deeper layers of the tree. No green detectable at all in this area. Again, somewhat normal appearing, but not completely normal appearing uh, bark over here. The bark is actually peeling back the outer layers. The inner layer, the cambium layer should be nice and green. Some of the sap wood uh, is oozing out some of the sap, getting opportunistic infection, uh, various mold, uh, fungal elements uh, moving in. Again, another area of sap exuding from the sap wood that is there. Uh, so that's all issues, things that, that, that are uh, severe. So we have opportunistic infections taking over in these trees. Here we can see where a tree, the uh, original branch was pinched off and allowing three main uh, trunks to be trained and come up. Here you can see one of the branches is broken up upside down, another branch down here in the crotch that's broken off, another branch up here broken off. And of course, you can see this large area where the deer took the antler and really rubbed pretty hard, ripping away all the bark, all the cambium layer, and just leading, leaving the heartwood uh, visible. Again, all of this area is completely abnormal. No bark here at all. You can see some of the bark, uh, uh, the inner bark left, and the sapwood left in this area. 
here you can actually see which should be the cambium layer so which is the outer surface of the uh, cambium the inner surface of the bark so the bark is peeled off you can see it here inner bark here and uh, here you can see some excoriations from the deer's antlers right in this location so a brief little discussion about what we've got for the for the tree the lumber that we we use in our buildings and in our furniture is the heartwood uh, there is some sap wood you can see in some places but that's the stuff that's ultimately going to be the be the rings that make up the heartwood and will be more uh, much more stru structural integrity as the the tree uh, continues to grow this is the, is the important layer this is the the vascular cambium layer and that cambium layer is, is like the, uh, the region of growth plates in our bones. So that allows us to make the, uh, the parts of our bone that are going to articulate in joints and lengthen our long bones as well. So this is just a couple of cell layers thick. It produces this phloem layer and it produces the xylem layer. So these cells uh, keep uh, replicating and producing more cambium layer but also produce uh, an outer layer that's, that develops into the uh, phloem, which is basically the inner part of the bark. It also differentiates into a specialized xylem layer as well. So these are all very important. And so when we scratch the outer bark off of a young, let's say a bare root tree or a young tree and want to see during the wintertime, is it still alive? Well, you should be able to see a nice, uh, fairly bright green surface indicating that that tissue is still alive and the tree has a good chance of surviving. So that phloem layer, which is out here, that's going to develop into bark, that's a vascular tissue, as I mentioned, and it conducts the sugars uh, from, the, from photosynthesis back down into the root system and feeds all of the other neighboring microorganisms in the soil which goes to other trees as well. So the sugars are produced as a result of uh, photosynthesis up in the leaves. So that comes down by the gravitational forces. That uh, the inner part of the cambium layer which is this xylem layer well, that takes, that's another vascular layer, and that goes, takes water from the soil, dissolves uh, particles, uh, salts, and nutrients that are dissolved in solution in the water, and it travels up through the uh, xylem layer and makes its way all the way up to, to the leaves, in some cases hundreds of feet high, and it does that by capillary action. Uh, the cambium layer giving rise to the phloem and the xylem. Now, the xylem la layer is unique in the sense that it is no longer a living tissue. It's going to ultimately develop into the heartwood into the center, but it's, it's a lot of tubules, similar to uh, the capillaries in our, uh, the most tiniest vessels in our body. And these tubules, uh, capillaries, uh, go all the way from the root surface all the way up to the, to the leaves of the tree, which can be a couple hundred feet uh, in the air from here. So how does that defy the forces of gravity? Well, there's two important part of, uh, properties of water. Uh, water is, uh, it shows a, a tendency due to the double hydrogen bonds to, to an oxygen of being very cohesive. The water molecules stick together. Like when we drop drops of water on a piece of glass, you see a little concave I'm sorry, convex surface, like a little dome, and that's because of the water molecules hold themselves together. So that's a cohesion. The water molecules also will bind to the surface of that little tubule going up, and that's adhesion. So that tends to pull the water up, and that's why when you see a small straw or a glass tube inside of a water bottle, the water level actually raises in height. It defies the laws of gravity because of those two properties of water cohesion and adhesion. Added to that at the leaf surface through uh, uh, evaporation, there's transpiration. So water is actually pulled up through those capillaries, those small tubes, right up to the leaves where the photosynthesis can take place. And at the end result of photosynthesis, we have the carbohydrates being made, certainly have oxygen being made as well. 
and those carbohydrates come back down through the phloem layer in the outer surface. So basically, we're taking out, uh, when, we, when we damage our bark and we, we destroy our cambium layer, we've taken out our circulatory system. So that's what actually happens. So what are the permaculture principles that are basically in place in this situation? Well, the first permaculture principle is observe and interact. You know, what are the forces on the, on the outside world that are having an effect on our site? Well, in this case, it's the white-tailed deer. So that's one thing we have to learn from that. Second, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. Well, what does that mean? We have to accept our failures. I failed here. How did I fail? Did I fail to protect the trees? Did I, did I plant them inappropriately? Uh, did, did I uh, plant trees that are, that are thin-skinned, more easily damaged by deer? Well, peaches and nectarines and, and almonds, uh, all of these species, uh, all of the species are, uh, are really not native to this area, this part of the world. They're, they're native, I believe, to China. Uh, and, and they don't last as long. They're, they're, they are more susceptible to damage, especially in a very cold, temperate climate. So another permaculture principle, principle use small and slow solutions. You know, start small, begin with small systems. Like I mentioned, I have uh, one food forest, two food forests, and this was the beginning of the third one. And, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? Last year or 20 years ago? So I was trying to rush get things started with all the trees so I could have as mo much production as possible without, uh, without taking into account that I needed to do better protection, especially down in this closer to the uh, you know, zone four area on the property where, where the wildlife are, are through, coming through all the time. What about the use in, and value of diversity? Certainly, that's an important thing. I've uh, planted other perennial crops around it, horseradish, uh, sea berries, nit nitrogen fixers, um, what else? Uh, I can't think of the rest right now, but a few, oh, gooseberries, uh, clover, and oh my goodness, I can't, oh, uh, honey locusts as well. So I put several different trees in there that are rapidly growing, that I coppice down, that w would produce other, other uh, food sources as well. But what did I do? I went ahead and I planted a whole row of a very similar, all the same species. Yes, they're different cultivars, but they are the same species. They're all peach trees. So if a deer really likes going down that area, they took out all of the, even though it was different varieties, they took out a whole bunch of peach trees in a row. So that wasn't using enough uh, interplanting, if we will, of different uh, tree crops there. So now what do I do? I got to creatively respond to this to this circumstance. So with my smaller trees I've used these removable tree guards. I put them in stakes, uh, use stakes, and you can see a whole variety of them here. And you can see, I don't know if you can see, there's wire caging around some of these other areas, but even these larger trees are damaged easily. So here's some of the wire fencing with stakes around them protecting some of the smaller trees. But as the trees got to be four, six, uh, eight inches in diameter, I thought I was set. I just let all of the deer prune off of the lower limbs. Uh, but they do come through and they really rip the heck out of all of the bark around. Again, here's another wire uh, enclosure around one of the smaller trees. Now here's one of the almond trees. I've got one of what I made for the um, tomato cages. I'm using concrete reinforcing wire. So this is a two foot loop. I'm gonna to have to make larger ones now as well. Here it is around up higher in the tree because the deer did actually get to some of my almond trees. So I thought I'd introduce, show one of the ways that I'm using the permaculture principles to look at you know, what I'm doing uh, wrong on site, some of my failures. So I thank you very much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you think this was valuable. Leave a comment or questions, and please share it with your friends. Thanks so much, folks, and have a great day.